But Rodney did call me yesterday and ask if I would preach for him because he is not feeling well. He has lost his voice. So it's always good to have a sermon in your back pocket. Unfortunately, my back pockets were empty. So <clears throat> we are going with hope. And of course, today is the, the first week of Advent, so hope is our, our theme for today. So if you guys will bear with me, I'm probably going to read a lot of this from my notes, but uh, we'll make it through. So let's, let's start with prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this opportunity to be here and worship you. We just pray that you open our hearts and our minds to your words, Father, so that we can apply it to our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. So as we enter this season of Advent, the first week focuses on hope. And as you've seen, we have lit the first candle of our wreath. Webster's defines hope as a feeling of expectation or desire for something to happen, to expect with confidence or to cherish a desire with anticipation, to want something to happen or to be true. Funny story about me, and I, I may have told this to a couple of you, but I don't like coffee. I know curse me. But I don't like coffee. I never have. I never will. You can thank my grandma Ruth for that. When I was a little kid, I wanted to try it so bad. And so she said, okay. And she drank the blackest, unsweet coffee you could probably drink. And I took a big old swig of that. And from that day forth, I have never tried coffee again. Now, I love the smell of coffee. I will smell it all day long. As a matter of fact, it was one of my favorite times. We used to have a restaurant downtown that I was told the guy would pour a cup of coffee or, excuse me, a pot of coffee right on the griddle and turn the fan on so that it would just vent all out of Stillwater and people would come there and eat breakfast in the morning. Pretty smart. And it smelled awesome. But I don't like it in liquid form. I don't like it in ice cream form. I don't like it in candy form. I just simply don't like coffee. However, one year I was on this mission work camp in Oklahoma City, and for some reason that week in the summertime was, was exceptionally cool, and it was stormy, and I heard all these college students that were there helping us that, that they were talking about this great cup of coffee. So as I'm listening, they're talking about this, this place called Coffee Slammers. I don't know if you've ever been there, but obviously it was the pinnacle of coffee shops in Oklahoma City at that time. And from them bragging about it, I was getting ready to go out on the job site. And so I was like, I'm going to stop by there and I'm going to get a cup of coffee. I'm going to try it to see if it'll, it'll work, if I like it, and so on. I walked in. It smelled amazing. And if you can imagine, you know, a, a coffee shop, if, if you've been in there, this was, this was a, a homegrown coffee shop. So it was just set up. It wasn't like your typical chain, Aspen, those types of things. So there were just cool stuff all over the place. And the smell was, was so overwhelming. But I looked up at the menu and somebody who's never ordered coffee, of course, I was lost. There wasn't a small or a medium or a large. Who, who doesn't call it small, medium, large? I don't even understand that. But then all these names and all these things, and, and I was like, I am so overwhelmed. So I just stopped and I was listening. And as I was listening, I was trying to find out what people were ordering the most, and I figured, well, that's what I'll order. And so I get up there, it's finally my turn, and I'm about ready to just, just say it with confidence, and I said, I want a hot chocolate. <clears throat> I couldn't do it. I couldn't stray away from what I knew to be my alternative to coffee, and I love hot chocolate, and yes, I'm a hot chocolate snob, so I like a really good cup of hot chocolate. But I was so pumped, this was going to be the greatest cup of hot chocolate I've ever had. Because I watched this guy, and he was a magician, this barista. See, I do know some of the terms. He was a magician, and he was getting things out of these copper canisters and, and these fancy, you know, places. And, and I was like, oh my gosh, this guy is loving making this hot coffee, or excuse me, hot chocolate for this guy that knows nothing about coffee. The sounds and the noises that were going on, the swishing of the milk, I didn't even know you could do that. My mouth was starting to water, and it was just because of this single cup of hot chocolate. My hope or optimistic state of mind that was based on an expectation of positive outcomes seemed to be generating an emotional 
attachment to this single cup of hot chocolate and the barista's ability to create it. Finally, he was done, couldn't wait. A masterpiece sat before me with this creative design of cream on the top and a small touch of whipped cream on the side. I paid my small fortune of $7, which of course was going to be worth it, right? I mean, $7, that's probably cheap today. And I took my first sip and it was awful. It was absolutely awful. Probably to date, the worst cup of hot chocolate I have ever had. It was bitter. It didn't taste chocolatey at all. And it was a complete letdown. But I played it off and just mmmed under my breath as I walked away. I forced down that $7 cup of hot chocolate and drove straight to Quick Trip for a 99 cent refill. And let me tell you, that was the best cup of hot chocolate I had had. It was so flavorful, chocolate in just the right temperature, it was perfect. Now, I start with this story because I believe it's important for us to understand that we place what we place our hope in. I embraced this coffee shop. I listened to the reviews, smelled the aromas, got caught up in the preparation. I was overwhelmed by the love and care, which all created an overwhelming desire for something great to happen. And in the end, I was disappointed, and all hope was lost. No more coffee, no more coffee shops, just the way it is. When I was preparing this sermon, I did a lot of web searching about hope and came across three types of hope. Type one is the person with no hope at all. In Ephesians 2.12, Paul wrote to the Gentile Christians that before they knew Christ, they were without hope. They were like foreigners to the covenants of the promise. But now in Christ Jesus, those who are once far away have been brought near through the blood of Christ. See, there's people in this world that live without hope every single day. It's not be, and, and most of this is because they don't know our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. As a church body, we're called to bring hope into the world, to share the light of Jesus Christ with others. We light this candle of hope today as a reminder that this is our commitment to share this light with others through the season. See, it's not just for us to light this candle. We're supposed to take that light into the world. It's a representation for us to get to work. And this is what starts our season. We're supposed to begin with bringing hope to those who are in a hopeless situation. We have multiple opportunities in which we can reach out and help those that are without hope. Mission trips, our daily bread, which I know tomorrow you're going to be having the opportunity to serve. I've got an announcement for that later. We have outreach programs. We collected, uh, I think the final count was 151 boxes that we were delivering uh, last Sunday that we put all sorts of things in to be delivered out to people. The Salvation Army gifts that you see up here in front of us. This has been collected by you all to be able to buy and provide gifts for kids who don't have that opportunity. And it's not out of duty, but it's out of an overflowing and overwhelming love for what Jesus did for us that we do that. It's that hope that is lit with inside of us. This is the example that Christ has set for you. The second type of hope is false hope. I googled, where can we find hope? It's very interesting. Now with all the AI, you know, there's all sorts of things that that pop up. And here are some of the few. Faith and spirituality. This is where we can find hope. Relationships with other people. Personal beliefs and values. Aspirations for the future. Our past experiences. Practicing gratitude. Taking a pause. Breathing exercises. And challenging negative beliefs. I'm sure we can also add some other things in there that we don't normally want to talk about. Some people probably try to find hope in drugs or alcohol, pornography, money, gambling, negative relationships, food, and success. It's amazing where we try to find hope. See, false hope is not built on a firm foundation. Much like the house built upon the sand, this is the person who thinks they can deal with life alone. 
Those who place their hope in the world or on people or the person that thinks that good deeds will bring them closer to God or those who believe they can live through life without consequences, well, that just doesn't happen. Through college, there was a lot of things that, of course, I learned, and I'm sure you have as well, and through your school. But there's one statement that my geography teacher, I'll never forget, and, and Dr. Smallwood was his name. And I sat through his, sorry, it was a history teacher, and, and I, I'll never forget this. One day, he just turns around out of nowhere, he says, there is no safe way out of life alive. And I don't know why that stuck with me, but it is just, it's always in my mind that there is no safe way out of life alive, which is so true, especially if we place our hope in things that will fade. Sure, it's possible to find hope in people, in relationships, our past experiences, and so on, but keep in mind that all those things have the potential to fail, which can lead us to the loss of hope. The statement, all hope is lost, well, it's a failed statement, and it's only lost if we are placing our hope in the wrong things. When we pursue God, it is not God who fails in the process, it is us. We are the ones that fail. Our failure produces suffering, perseverance, character, and eventually we obtain hope because we realize that through our failures, God remains true, and our pursuit of that truth is what gives us hope, the hope that comes from God. And then there's type three. Type three is true hope. Titus 2.13 says, while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself up for us, to redeem us from all wickedness, and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. See, the true hope is Jesus Christ. It's the love that Jesus Christ showed for us by dying on the cross for our sins when he did not need to do that. It was his ability to sacrifice himself so that through our flaws and through our mistakes and through our issues that we deal with, that we have one true direction that we can, of course, rely on even when things are at their worst. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. See, faith and hope are kind of like a, I always saw them as a little brother and big brother or, or siblings in the Bible. They were always there together. You have faith and then you have hope. Well, see, faith is, is understanding the message and hearing the message. And because we hear that message, we have faith in Christ. We have faith in God to do those things in our life that he has promised. However, hope comes from experience. We don't just hope automatically. Hope usually comes from something we've gone through. We're always seeking hope. It's not... It's not still, it's not one thing, it's, it's ongoing, it's a verb, it's an action, it's something we pursue. Romans 5, 3, 4 says, we also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that sufferings produce perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured us out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. It is through our life experiences that we have come to know Jesus Christ. Whatever we've been through, are going through, or will go through, we are meant to look to our blessed hope, Jesus Christ, to get it through us. One of the things I always try and tell youth, of course, when you're working with kids that are certain ages, one of the major challenges is getting them to live a life and a Christian life that was not their parents. I love it when parents bring kids to church, and that, that is the, the gateway to Christianity for, for my students. But there's a point in their life that their Christianity, their decision to follow Christ has to be their own. They can't live through your experiences. They have to live through their own. They have to understand what their commitment is to Christ, And it stretches beyond, hopefully, through what you have taught them and what they're going to take out into the world. I was able to uh, go to Kamioka, Japan, take some students there, and I had this awesome experience that that nobody else in the group got to to do. And, And I was able to go parasailing. And so, as I was 
listening to the instructions of everything that we were supposed to do, the, the instructor says, when I tell you to go, you're going to take three or four steps slowly. And then when I start saying, go, 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 you're going to run as fast as you can and don't stop until I tell you. And all I could think in my mind was this Dude Perfect video where those guys went out and they were doing the same thing and they told him to run and he did. And as soon as he started running, he stopped and they tripped and somehow the instructor kept going and drug him along. And I was like, I'm not going to do that. And so we're on this hill and it's really steep and I'm standing there and all of a sudden the wind, we're waiting for wind, that's what we're waiting on. And then we're just sitting there in this huge sail, which of course was the biggest one that they had, was laying back there on the ground and we're just waiting for the wind to shift. We're not doing anything, we're not moving, we're just being patient. And then all of a sudden you see the windsock just turn and that sail just picks up and it's huge and it's wide and he goes, okay, take off walking. And so I took three or four steps and then next thing I know, go, 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 go. He's just yelling, go, 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 go. And I am running as fast as I can and I'm so happy and we're off the ground and I don't know it and I'm still running and we're floating out there and finally I realize, okay, I can, I can stop. And in my brain, I'm thinking, I just hope that this sail opens up because if it doesn't, it's going to be a bad day. Now, I did put my hope in something that would fail, that could possibly fail. But see, the experience of that is what lets me go farther in life. I've experienced something that has taken me closer to God and given me that opportunity. And I think of Jeremiah 29, 11, when I, th when I look at that and I think about that message, it says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. God is not here to allow all these things that happen in our lives. They're not there to, to make us sad. And, and, and there's some people that just feel like, well, God's doing this for me for a reason. I don't think that's the case. However, I do believe that God is trying to give us a way to use those things in our life to become stronger and to pursue hope and to pursue something that is greater. Because if we get stuck there in that moment, then we're not seeking what God wants from that opportunity. Isaiah 40, 31 says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength they will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. To hope in God brings an unending strength that does not fail. It is always there for each and every one of us. Romans 15, 13 says, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with the hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This is what I feel like we're supposed to be doing on Sunday mornings. We come here, and the God of hope is supposed to fill us with the joy and peace so that we can now overflow for the world and go out and do what God has called us to do. Whatever your story, there's hope. Hope that overflows out of you and into the lives of others. Think about what you do right now in your life and how you could use your story to better the people that are out there in the world. As long as your story is based in the foundation of Jesus Christ, then that story should be there to change the lives of other people. So where does your hope come from? My hope comes from Jesus Christ. He is who I put my faith in. He is unfailing. He is the sacrifice for us. He is the redeemer. He is our true hope. Now, just like Rodney, I like to give an application. So here you go, application number one, and then we'll pray and be finished. A application number one, ask yourself, which type of hope are you subscribing to? Are you a type one, no hope person? Are you a type two, false hope, where you're placing your hopes in the wrong things? Or are you type three, and that's you're seeking and pursuing the true hope through Jesus Christ? And application number two, how can you take that light out into the world and give hope to other people this week and throughout this Advent season. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much again for the opportunity to be here today. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for our sins, who didn't have to, 
who chose to, who chose to give us a life that was based in hope and love and life-changing events that we go through and experience. I pray that as we go through life, Father, we can understand how we use those opportunities to spread your word. In your name we pray. Amen.